So looks like we've got similar sizes before, but I see a few different people. So I'm wondering if we should um, just start off by asking the question of how what people think would be the most useful way to do this this time. Uh, my interest would be to help people understand how the system works, how to use it. Um, and so I think people have various levels of, of what they know about it. And I probably the best way to do that is to find out from everybody, from you, you know, how you would like to run this. Maybe we should spend like five minutes to have people kind of make suggestions of what they think would be the most useful way to get the information out. And so why don't people just decide to speak up, say what they think. And if two people speak, then just please uh, try to let the other, per you know, try to speak one at a time. Or you can type in the PBAS development channel as well. Another question. I'm trying to understand how you have the 100% liquidity. Like, you know, if let's just say 10% is held by one individual, how can you say 100% liquidity? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's a, that's a great question because it kind of gets to the core of how the reserve currency and exchange system works. So um, the math that's used to convert between currencies is based on an exponential formula that actually is the same basic formula that Bancor uses but it expresses kind of exactly what happens in a reserve currency, which is um, there's a certain reserve that the entire currency supply is exchangeable between. If somebody um, sells the reserve currency to its uh, reserve, then there's a formula that's actually completely reversible that the lower the reserve... So, so here, let me start with a, just a, an explicit and concrete example. So if you have a 10% reserve currency, then if you have $100,000 of Varus in that currency, the currency will have a market cap of a million. Because if you have... Uh, if, if there's a 1 to 10 ratio, you have a 10% um, reserve currency, you can actually make it so that the um, final currency has 10 times the supply as the reserve, and you'd have a one-to-one -one price correspondence. But when you sell from the reserve currency to Varus, you'll have a curve that causes it to go down pretty steeply. You can sell every single coin of the reserve currency one by one down to zero, always getting something back, but it's not going to be the same one-to-one -one if you're selling it, just selling it. So it follows basically market forces with a volatility, and, and you can think of it as like the strength of, of its resistance to being moved, which is effectively the percent of re the reserve. If you buy it, it goes up according to market forces the same way. But you don't need someone to sell it to you because the blockchain will mint it for you when you buy it. But you're going to make the coin value go up. And the, a 50% reserve will kind of go down in about a straight line when you're selling it you know, with like a 45-degree angle if everyone was selling it. And it'll go up with a 45. And, and a 10% reserve currency will kind of Go up pretty quickly and go down pretty quickly because because it doesn't have a lot of reserves. Um, but if people are using it for something, then the more they use it, the more people have it, the more it's going to go up. If people are simply using it for commerce, buying and selling, and you know there's a there's a lot of commerce, it will tend to stay the same, and its value will tend to reflect the economy that it is being used on. If people use it as a way to, um, you know, say, make a currency that 
starts with a hundred thousand dollars and all of a sudden it's worth a million the next day, which you can do, you know, by market cap, then everybody's just going to sell it and take the money out. And, you know, the people who don't sell, it's just going to be like a, a race to, um, a billion dollar currency. And that currency is going to, you know, be managed. Like we're going to manage how people get it or, or we're going to allow people even to mine or stake their loyalty currency, you know, and they can feel this connection and we can send them, you know, uh, little Z transactions and actually get them to open them because they're going to have money in them. And we don't even have to pay, you know, Google or Microsoft to do that. You've got this connection all of a sudden to your people who actually care about your company or brand or whatever else through the blockchain. And, and you've got this actual currency that can be converted to or from uh, Varus or other loyalty currencies. And the, and if people want to use your product, say you give a 15% discount if they pay with that currency, then they're going to be buying the currency. And if you decide that you're not going to be selling all your currency and you're going to kind of use it as a storage of you know your profits and things, it's going to be going up. And so um, it has a 100% like total liquidity, even with a reserve ratio that doesn't represent the entire market cap of a coin. But whether it goes down or up is really totally subject to market forces and how the coin is used, um, what it represents, pretty much in all cases. Does that make sense, Rosa? All right. Well, if anyone uh, has ideas, of, you know, I think maybe – go ahead, Michael. No, nothing. I just unmuted myself just in case. Okay. So I think uh, – the question, I mean, the best way probably to handle it right now, if someone wants an introduction to any part of the system, I'd be happy to provide that. But I have this feeling since we've now done, you know, two different, or two different discussions prior to this, that the best way would be to let someone ask, feel free to ask, you know, I'm sure that if there are other people who have already heard it before, but you haven't, um, that someone else might want to hear it again because there's a lot of detail here and there's a lot of capability so i think we'll just let's just leave it open for questions about um ideally you know how you can make it work or 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 open questions that you have about its value or or what it does these kinds of things and everyone should just feel free to speak up and and ask and i'm just gonna wait and and let people ask there's also if anybody I've, I mean, I've seen people type out ideas and things that they think it could be used for and just like random things that come to mind every once in a while. So anything like that is about locations and things like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I got a question. Um, on the first screenshots Mike shared in uh, our general discussion, uh, I noticed he had a uh, reserve of about 50,000 uh, coins. And when mm -hmm. I looked this afternoon, it was over 500,000 uh, coins in reserve. Can you explain uh, why that grows that much? Oh, actually, uh, the one that I posted, it was my, it was one that I was testing, you know, and it was a different chain. It just had the same name because it was on, you know, my local test net. And so the one that I posted just had different parameters and I thought that it would be nicer because I was trying to, I was trying to make it as volatile and kind of trying a lot of different parameters to, to just check the equations and make sure that things are working as expected. And so when we made it available on the public test net, then I made a reserve with premine chain that had a larger um, starting reserve and just a larger, uh, you know, a larger currency basically um, so that more people could play around with it and probably see a more realistic case because the first one that I, you could make small currencies and they can grow and, and the reserve just to, to address part of your question, the reserve, anytime someone buys the coin that will increase the reserve. 
So a coin can grow from very small to very large, and it will appreciate all the way up. Um, so you can start coins that are not huge. The, the challenge will be, you know, having, like I still don't know yet, when we do staking of the reserve, a chain will actually be able to pay miners and stakers and people who are interested in it with the reserves that it holds on Varus and probably have, you know, reserves left over to even replenish its reserves um, on a regular basis, I believe. And especially as the system grows and people are doing more and more commerce and you get more fees and you get more chain launches, you know, then I think, um, I think that people will be able to create really interesting currencies or projects and their reserves will, the, the interest effectively, or, but it will actually be actively staked from their reserves will pay for all the costs of, um, of their chain, kind of the way that a, a chain today pays for itself, you know, if you make it yourself, but you got a lot more work to do around it. And this way they get to leverage all of the things that are in the various ecosystem. So, um, so you can grow the reserve in a few different ways. You can buy the coin and that, you know, that takes reserve. It puts it into the coins reserve and it um, gives you supply of the coin. It mints supply in the process. Or you can sell it, which actually reduces the reserve because then you're taking reserve from it. Um, or we, you know, there will be other ways to put in reserve. For example, I, I really think that um, if you've got a coin with a large reserve, the, the way that the staking, the way that I'm thinking of the staking will work is if you're notarizing that chain, and the way you notarize a chain is you're either merge mining or you're staking on that chain so you have some of its currency. And the fact is that notarization of a chain into Varus will be um, weighted so that the notaries are, and this is just natural just because of the protocol, so that the notaries are more often than not stakers of that chain. Because all of the stakers, every time they get a block, if it's within a time period or like a, a block period where they can notarize, they have an opportunity to notarize, which is an opportunity to make the benefits of notarization. For merge mining, the only way that you can notarize across chains on a merge mine is if you actually do merge mine a block. So if you're mining on Varus and you're mining on a chain and you merge mine so that you end up with the same header for both chains, you just earn the right to notarize and that proves that you're not just some random miner, you're actually a pretty, you know, you're mining on Varus and you got a block and so it kind of gives you a little more a little more credibility if you do that at the same time as you're all lined up. So, um, so because of that, yeah. You know, I'm thinking that the right way to use the reserves for staking is that if you notarize, then you get the right to stake the entire supply of that coin when you're, it's going to be after your notarization gets confirmed. So you can't just do a notarization, it has to be a confirmed notarization. So you're going to get the right to then stake the supply of that coin, but you won't get all of it because some of it's going to have to go back into the coin is either going to pay for like one way of doing it is it pays for notarization rewards and all the notaries just earn from that you know um one way of doing is it is that some of it pays for notarization rewards some of it goes back into the supply or i mean i'm sorry the reserve of the coin and if it goes into the reserve of the coin without you know some can go to the actual notary that that obviously did it or they wouldn't care about doing it. So you got to give them some. But then if it goes into the supply, you could actually make it just go right into the supply. I mean, into the reserve, I'm sorry. And, and raise the price just because it went into the reserve. Or you could have it go into the reserve and lower the reserve ratio um, and make the coin less volatile and kind of replenish any emissions that the coin might be making on block emissions. So there are really, I guess, the, the thing to take away from all of that long explanation is that 
there are a lot of options that give a lot of power for how people can set up and structure blockchain, its currency, and its reserve conversion capabilities. And because there's a lot of power, um, you know, I think it's going to take some thought for someone, as, as some of us already found out on Testnet, you know, it's going to take some thought on the parameters to say, how will this currency unfold over time? You know, and, and I think that um, consultants would do well to help people out. And, you know, an application like a polling application could have a certain way that it, st- that it structures a blockchain. And someone's going to put time into figuring out what that way is for the application once, but then it can do it a whole bunch of times and its blockchains can just come and go. Um, and they'll, they'll be known to be kind of the right way. But I think it's going to be a learning process. And right now, you know, the important thing is to make it possible for people to do, to generally do mathematically all of these different things, not to, not to make rules about that and maybe suggest best practices and, and guide against pitfalls. And then, um, and then we learn. But you can grow your reserves in a number of different ways. And I didn't grow those reserves um, in that same chain. It was a different chain that started with more reserves. Okay. I was just basically two different chains uh, that happened to have the same name. Yes. Yeah. It is possible that the chain grown that much if it started with 50,000, given it had enough people converting into it. Yeah, I mean, we can, you know, we can make a test chain and, and, and everybody can buy into it and they can buy into it at launch time and they'll get, you know, the, everyone who buys in at launch time gets the same deal, everyone. So the person who starts the chain in their initial contribution and everybody else who puts in money, if it's, if it's allowed to have other people send money to it for the launch, um, everybody gets the same deal when it comes to the conversion, even on a reserve currency or on a non-reserve currency, um, there is going to be you know, this option to take a pre-mine and to take a fee. So obviously the people who get a pre-mine, that's not the same deal. And the people who get a fee, that's not the same deal. But everyone who converts to the coin by putting in funds, that's the same deal. And start block. On, the, on the start block. And and those funds will actually show up on the blockchain within, you know, the first few blocks. They'll be there to the address that they were sent to. And you, in fact, they don't actually, they're the only coins at first that don't have to wait for maturity to be able to be used. So they can be used, right? You know, people join a chain launch and they send coins to the chain launch to convert to the native coin when the chain launches. Or they even send reserves to the chain launch. Then once the chain launches, they can buy the coin, they can sell the coin, they can do different things. Okay? Um, and then the miners and stakers on that will get a lot of fees. You know when conversions happen, and they can you know have the normal maturity for the for the uh, things that they mine and stake. And then you know once the chain is started, every buy is going to be a buy according to the formulas based on the current reserve ratio of the coin. Now, Bancor, if I'm going to use them as an example, even though we do front running and other things that they don't do, um, we solve. Bancor, what they do is you define a currency and you define the reserve ratio. And then, and then you, you can change it through APIs, but that's it. And what we're doing is this is kind of, you know, we're doing mining, we're doing staking, we're doing a currency that has this permissionless you know, incentivized um, network, peer-to-peer model. And so what we do is when you emit coins, in your, if you're talking about a normal blockchain that doesn't do reserves, when, when it emits coins for a block, a block reward, it doesn't mean that the coin went down in value. You don't know if the coin is going to go up or down. It only means there are more coins for people to sell. If everybody just sells and nobody buys, the coin's going to go down in value. But just to emit the coins, you know, it really shouldn't necessarily determine that the value should change. 
And so what we do is when coins are emitted, the um, reserve ratio slightly changes, slightly to accommodate those emitted coins. And the price stays exactly the same. But, but in reality, I, I actually had to put in what's called banker's rounding, which is like um, when every time we emit coins on the blockchain, then in order to um, recalculate the reserve ratio, it can be off by you know a Satoshi or so. So the price, the price can actually vary by a Satoshi or so you know, maybe sometimes even two, maybe um, from block to block, if you emit, say, 100 coins and you've got a small coin, you know, that so that's a large chunk, you know, it could really change a little bit. And so um, I put in the statistically even rounding so that it basically stays the same. You know, it might change a little bit. It might go down a Satoshi, it might go up a Satoshi. But over a long period of time, the price will stay the same just by emission. And so it's only by market forces, either selling or buying, that the coin is going to change its price. And the other really interesting thing that I've run tests on, you can run your own test. If the same number of people sell the same amount according to the current price and buy the same amount according to the current price, they pretty much all get what the current price was. And a little bit of fees get converted into the coin, so it slightly goes up in price, but they pretty much get like exactly the same price. And if you sell and no one else buys or does anything, and then you take what you got from that sale and you buy again, you pretty much just pay the little tiny fees that are these 0.01% in both directions. And it just reverses the equations just reverse back and forth. It's really, it was really exciting to see it start running. And so anyways, long, long answer and just talking. So I should stop and let the next, a uh, person ask things that they might be wondering about. Uh, Mr. Tongi? Yes? Um, I have a question about um, how um, when you basically create your currency through PBAS, yeah. uh, the idea is that you'll be able to, to exchange these currencies to bearers, correct? And I was just wondering how it's going to be done. Is it going to be on a certain platform where your coin has to be listed along with bears to exchange it or oh uh, no no it it, it 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 oh thank you for asking that because maybe other people have that question it, it already works today on testnet and it doesn't require an exchange at all and it's just built into the protocol and this is the reserve currency protocol so um you can try it out on testnet uh we're gonna i am gonna make an update that'll have features like the refunds working really nicely and, and these kinds of things and and, and address some things that we found. So you can, and there will be a GUI coming in. I don't know exactly when, but as soon as it's ready. Um, but no, the protocol is what does that. The protocol and the blockchain is effectively acting as the market maker and managing the value between the different currencies based on formulas that follow you know, the market behavior of the um, people interested in either buying or selling the currencies. What it doesn't do is it actually doesn't leave room for, um, you know, people whose primary focus is to skim off of, you know, other people's losses. It doesn't really leave uh, room for that. It does leave room for arbitrage, as we talked about earlier, so that, you know, exchanges for coins can still make sense because there's going to, they're basically, basically the exchanges end up being futures markets for the coins um, because the blockchain is always the final price for these coins. But no, it doesn't require, there's no listing, there's no cost to have this work for any uh, project in the ecosystem. It's just a built in part of the protocol. And in fact, if a project makes a chain, that has a reason for people to want to do a lot of commerce on it. All the fees generated from the exchange between Varus and that coin, once the chain is running, are paid out to people mining and staking that coin on that chain. Okay, thank you for your answer. Mm -hmm. Does that um, answer I'll, the question? Yeah, yeah it does. Okay. Um, I'm not really uh, sure about all the technical details because um, I still have to do research on this. Okay. But 
also was wondering about uh, what you think about the Atomic Dex launch. Uh, what do you think of it in terms of like increasing liquidity for various coin? So I think Atomic Dex is great. And I actually, so here's the thing. Varus Coin enables people to create, the, the first release enables people to create currencies that are fully liquid across the entire Varus ecosystem. And as the ecosystem grows, when people do that, of course, Varus is going to naturally have more liquidity because everybody doing that is, you know, they want liquidity for Varus as well. Atomic Dex is you know, the technology that allows this decentralized exchange across uh, like basically any different um, blockchain that it can support, which is many, many, many different blockchains. And it does it through more of a, you know, the traditional exchanging human, you know, trading model rather than kind of building in a market maker into the blockchain and allowing it to be done mathematically and so um but it also bridges it can bridge the entire you know varus ecosystem with other through atomic decks with other blockchains and so it definitely i think is it's a great thing that they launched their public beta and i i hope that it works super well i hope people use it and it and it ends up being another decentralized tool for liquidity across the entire crypto ecosystem, and I think that's great. And and so, um, yeah, I think it can be another piece of the puzzle for the for the you know worldwide liquidity across everything. Then there's also I, I should mention because it's something that we're going to end up doing at some point. There's also going to be the ability. So right now we have this built into the protocol and testnet, and it works with these super low fees and all the fees go to miners and stakers and there's no one, no company because we're a community coin. There's no company taking anything out of it. And so it really provides an opportunity for people to create these currencies without having to pay exorbitant fees. And if they've got great consultants, you know, all the fees, they like everything they would have to pay could just go to consultants to help make things work even better. And so, so we've got that kind of protocol in place, but there's still this world of crypto. I mean, Bitcoin's not tiny, you know? So even though I think this opens up new possibilities beyond what Bitcoin can do, you know, we want to bridge to all cryptos. And, you know, so what Bancor does is they create these, um, they're called these exchange, I actually, I, I think of them as exchanger tokens. I, I think they've had a few names. I don't know. They might relay tokens or different things like that. But but the point is that to create one of these, it's like a like a you, you could make one of these with our technology too, but it's not built into this protocol yet. And what this does is it allows you to make a reserve coin that uses two or maybe even more different coins as its reserve. And so you would say it's a 50% reserve of both, say, Varus and, you know, Komodo. And then um, anyone could buy that coin with either Varus or Komodo and sell that coin to either Varus or Komodo according to the same math that we're using for these uh, reserve, fractional reserve um, currencies. There is a difference, and the difference is that every time someone buys it then they, or sells it, either way, then they can effectively create an imbalance in the price between, it changes the price. Like they, They'll get a little bit of a, of a slipped price, so it's going to, you know, the smaller amount they buy or sell, the more their there's a certain like the weight of that exchanger token is basically an order book, and the more people put into the reserves at first, the heavier it's going to be, the less it's going to be, the more it's going to be able to exchange larger amounts without costing anything. And then other people can come along and they can rebalance it because it's an arbitrage opportunity to make the price always perfect, just naturally. That is what happens. 
And so aside from technologies that do just decentralized exchange, which I think Atomic Dex is great. And I think that they, you know, if anyone's got experience in this kind of thing, it's, it's the Komodo whole Komodo ecosystem and the Komodo platform. And so I'm really happy to see that becoming available, but also there will be other ways to bridge between different blockchains. And, um, and so I think, you know, there will be this ability for blockchains in the Verus ecosystem. And because we're going to build it, then I'm, I'm sure that, you know, Komodo is going to, um, at some point want to put the, this next one that I'm talking about, you know, on a blockchain. Cause this idea that I'm thinking about would be something that you don't have to have as a cross chain capability. So it might be easier to do without having the entire PBAS capability. So you might be able to do this more easily on a blockchain that can, con- that can, um, handle crypto conditions. And the idea would be that you create also, um, tokens on a blockchain that can be these converters. So you can imagine having uh, a PBAS fractional reserve blockchain that gets to have other assets on it that can provide conversion services. And someone w- would want to do that because really, you know, it's a little bit of a business because they're providing effectively an exchange and the, and the heavier they make their exchanger tokens, the more their exchange will be able to handle um, for people, and then they earn money on the arbitrage. I mean, I, anyways, I'm sorry if I got too detailed on that answer, um, but hopefully it helped to answer the question. And maybe if anyone else wants to ask, I'll just wait. Okay, I uh, I know this was asked yesterday and you answered it yesterday, but I think there are some people in here that haven't heard that answer yet. All right. Uh, what will be the advantage for uh, the general miner to merge mine? Oh, <laughs> that's yeah. So that is a great question because merge mining. I I am really looking forward to having um, merge mining real chains and real projects because so right now you know the the whole blockchain mining community is really it's all about block rewards i mean you're always it's always just about the block rewards and and i my opinion from the very beginning is that that's really good but i actually don't think that that is a sustainable system over the long run because blockchains can do a lot more than just process the transactions that move the numbers, you know, that keep the ledger. And in order to do that, like just this 0.01% fee for exchanging, like uh, on Binance, if you're doing a hundred million dollars a month of volume yourself, you'll get a 0.05% conversion, like exchange fee. You'll still have to deal with a spread. You know, this model says, Everybody, no matter how big or how small your conversions are, you pay a 0.01% fee because there's no need for Binance for this, you know? And, and oh boy, that's recorded, huh? We want to be listed on Binance. <laughs> they should list Varus because... <laughs> they should list Varus because all the volume is going to be behind it. But, uh, <laughs> but what I'm saying is that when people are converting on Varus at 0.01% with no spread, how can you get a better deal than that, really? And at the same time, miners and stakers, like, you know, when I started that reserve with Premine chain on uh, Varus testnet, I earned 56 uh, coins on a 24 block reward, you know, coin. I earned 56 coins in fees you know, just from converting to the uh, 500,000 reserve or whatever was in 550,000 reserve or whatever is in there, you know, that's a lot of fees. And, and actually that was, um, if you've got a chain that's doing a lot of conversions because they've got interesting things to do, the people who are doing the conversions feel like they're getting a fantastic deal. And geez, miners and stakers are only taking this tiny bit, but 
compared to what exchanges are making today, we just disintermediate the whole need for that thing. And the miners and stakers are really the ones making everything happen. So they get all the all the rewards and they'll be, you know, it's like more than we've ever had as miners and stakers. And now you get to do 15 at the same time when you're mining, you know, and they're all generating different different fees for different things. And you make those, oh, and and I think I mentioned it yesterday, but if you're mining just on Varus, like, okay, merge mining, you get to do notarization, you get to make money on that. You get to make money on all the different chains. If you're merge mining reserve chains, the money you make is all convertible. So it's basically you're just making more. Um, and if you're, mer- if you're mining on any chain, like Varus, just Varus, and other chains are sending transactions cross-chain from Varus to the other chain, you make money on the uh, export and import transactions that you don't even have to merge mine or stake on the other chain to make. So when you export, mine, when you mine on Varus, this is part of the uh, high-scale cross-chain transaction capability. When you mine on Varus, you're actually, every time you make a block, you're aggregating, because it's profitable to do, you're aggregating all the exports to other chains. And if there are, you know, a few hundred chains running across the various ecosystem, you don't have to be merge mining or staking them to export, to, to aggregate their exports. And when you do aggregate their exports, you get to mine that in and take an export fee. If you're the miner that aggregated their exports, you get to take an export fee, which is actually can be significantly bigger than normal transaction fees. But the person who sent the cross-chain transaction, because you're aggregating, actually doesn't end up having to pay much more than normal kind of fees. And so you get to aggregate this. It's a little more, which means that's why you make more when you aggregate it. You get to aggregate this, and if you import from, a trans- from another chain, you also make import fees. So you make export fees and you make import fees, but you aren't responsible for having to connect to the other chains and make sure the transactions get to the other chains because the people who do that are the no, typically the notaries that are working cross-chain on those chains. And so everybody kind of who helps make it, it the protocol is made to just work. And everybody kind of has their part, you know. And, and you can have a role on one chain that helps to make things move forward. You can have a, a role across chains to make you know, the cross-chain things happen, or you can have just a role as using everything. And it all works statistically together to just make it all correct and happen. And, um, and everyone makes money when they do their part in any of those roles across any of the chains and it, and because it's all liquid you know it's all just money in the ecosystem but the ecosystem is just capable of doing much more Does that make sense yes it does uh, in short uh, if you mine or stake you earn uh, a lot more than now yeah you're you're contributing to more commerce as the ecosystem grows then you know, then a single blockchain, almost any single blockchain as we really grow, probably, you know, I think this, whoever ends up doing something like this and being the one that really grows, you know, to to offer these services to everybody who wants them, um, I think this model can offer uh, more earnings for people who make it happen because they're making a lot more actually happen than, than a normal blockchain. Hey, thank you. Thanks. So uh, any other uh, question? Um, If there isn't, then you can feel free to interrupt me. But um, I'm going to have to go in a few minutes. So I was just thinking uh, I could describe basically of how you would have currency and maybe the how easy it is to use it on the GUI that's going to come out soon. So I want an idea of that would be great for me functionally. I'll be quiet, and that would be great for me. For I think other people would probably want to hear that too. Well, um, so start with uh, some of you I know have used the previous 
GUI test wallet and have created your own chains through that. Those of you that haven't, uh, basically there's a PBAS screen if you're using the Varus testnet and it's like a tab. So if you go there, your currency, um, it's what you do is go to the create tab and you fill out in a form. I think it's like steps maybe, or yeah, I think around six steps. It's just, you just fill in like the name of your chain, um, buy certain things about it. You say like what you want the reward structure to be. That's how it's been so far. Reserve currency is being introduced. Um, now you can actually specify, first of all, if you want it to be a reserve currency, you don't have to make a reserve currency, but if you want it to make a reserve currency, the check a box, fill in how much you're going to contribute initially to the reserve. Thought about this idea of like maybe the public contributing and to your chain for a fixed price before it launches while it's been declared uh, and all that goes towards your reserve but contribute the entire reserve yourself so say you wanted to have initially by a million varus well if you had a million varus you could just put it there yourself and full owner of the coins on your chain if you want it to be to contribute you could open it up basically it's like one button you just check it and all of a sudden your chain can be opened up for people to contribute minimum amount that gets contributed if it's below that amount um it won't launch if people haven't contributed that amount like the kickstarter model that we were talking about earlier this is all basically how it works in the client that prefer using a graphical um, user interface uh, can i i'm sorry can i just say one thing because of what you just said and i want to just add i think uh -huh. we should I think just to be respectful of Kickstarter as, you know, we're this community and it's a company, it's a brand, we probably always want to think about saying Kickstarter-like because we're not, we would never want people to confuse that, you know, this is in fact somehow connected to that brand. It's way better than what they are, but, you know, if we refer to it that way, they might kind of get upset. Okay. Thanks. Kickstarter-like oh, checkbox used anywhere in the interface. It allows people to come in and fund your reserves for you before your official start of the chain in for a fixed price. And then anything Varus test coins, later Varus coin that they buy in with gets added to the reserve of the chain when it launches. Um, you can set, like I said, a minimum amount and a maximum amount. The minimum amount, if your chain doesn't reach it by the time it starts, it won't launch. If you reach the maximum amount, then contribute anymore, and then it'll launch. And uh, the rest of the stuff is pretty, the chain is pretty simple and self-explanatory in the form. So I'm going to skip over that for now. Sending to a chain your Varus or Varus test coins to that chain, you'll actually be able to see something that I'm going to define in the GUI, in a gamma, chain status. I know there's a currency state right now in the client, so I'm not going to confuse those two things, but it's more like a indicator of how the chain is doing. So if the chain is in its pre-launch phase and it's open for people to contribute, pre-convert icon, for example, where you'll be able to know that now is the time where you can send coins to that chain for a fixed rate that's also displayed, contribute to its reserves, and have some coins when it launches. Pre-launch phase, which is for chains that chose not to open it up for pre-conversions, and that's just the chain's going to launch, here's the launch date or launch block, be available then. Then there's like running, which is just the chain is launched already successfully, everything worked out. If it failed to meet, it's actually didn't end up launching. And funded where it's reached its maximum conversion rate and you can no longer to it. Um, so being this 10 screen, it's all going to be simply integrated. So it's all going to have descriptions, little help icons, everything, so that it's easy to use. And uh, Michael, can, can I um, mention one thing? Because I know it, and I don't know if it was really clear in what you just said. But the, you're talking about the normal, like just the regular send screen, right? That's right. going to now on a on a PBAS reserve chain is going to now have um, options that relate to sending either uh, the native coin or reserve coins. Is that right? 
Right. So I okay, yeah, I'll, I started in the thanks. PBS tab and like with the create form, but now I'm talking about the send screen. I'm just yeah, I'm, yeah. I just didn't that's like the, know if it was clear that that was the the one that people use today for normal sends. That's the same screen. Uh, yeah. So there's just going to be a few more buttons there that you can press if you're on PMS chain or if you're on the various test chain. You'll see like send off chain, and you can tick send off chain, and it'll be like, okay, well, enter the chain that you want to send to. Press connect. It'll f fetch the details of that chain, what state it's in, if you can send coins to that chain right now, if it actually launched, if it's in the pre-launch phase, conversion rate is, if it's a reserve currency, and if it hasn't launched yet, it'll tell you when it will launch so that you know test block height, stuff like that. So hopefully for those of you uh, GUI um, can really benefit from all these things. Hopefully it'll clear it up and help explain a lot of the concepts behind it right now. I know that super easy to on-ramp straight to the client, so this will kind of ease that process. And if anybody has any questions, then feel free to ask, but I got to go in a few minutes because I have to wake up pretty early. So Thank you. Any questions for, for Michael before he takes off, for me, for anyone actually, uh, for Oink you know, on, on the website, um, but probably things related to uh, public blockchains as a service and, and reserves. I think we're getting close to a time we might want to start to wrap up, but uh, if anyone's got questions, then we'd like to get them answered. And uh, for those of you that just joined or haven't been here the whole time or weren't here in the last if you don't have a mic or you don't want to talk for whatever reason or anything, just feel free to write a question in the PMS development channel and we'll read that too. I have a question pertaining to the notary note system um, and uh, would like to learn uh, whether Verus um, envisions to entirely rely on uh, that second layer um, of security, which uh, of which the governance is completely outside of uh, the Veros realm, or whether at some point uh, Veros uh, would sort of um, intend to co you know to to build coexisting notary nodes in order to fulfill uh, the functions that currently the Komodo notary nodes will perform in terms of notarizing uh, the asset chains of which in their hierarchy Veros is one. Uh, and then subsequently uh, upstream notarize into Bitcoin? Well, hmm, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, but so right now, every PBAS chain could be notarized with Komodo, you know, as long as it takes Komodo notaries to spin up on a chain, usually some days or... Um, but they're already kind of pre-prepared for that. Uh, so when it hits mainnet, that, that'll be an option for chains. But um, the, the notar there is a notarization. There, there's no need in the Verus ecosystem to run a notary node in order to notarize in the current protocol. Um, there is an auto-notarization protocol in the Verus ecosystem, but it's not really the same. It's a trustless protocol that doesn't have you know, elected notaries or this kind of thing. And so um, we talked about this er in an earlier call, and I'll bring it. I'll mention it again because probably other people would want to know. The you know it takes a little time for the notarization, the auto notarization, to happen. Excuse me, just a minute. It takes a little um, time for it to happen with the auto -notar notarization protocol, but with Komodo, you know, you have this kind of trust built into the notary nodes, the, the group of notaries. And so the, my thinking on that is that we, need, we will have at some point like a notary list or, or you know, a notary group for any chain or group of chains, and Komodo notaries could be that group. Each chain, Varus is actually notarized by uh, Komodo. And, and so it's also, you know, participating in this cross notarization across the various uh, PBAS chains. So other chains could, through the various notarization protocol, <laughs> say, well, we're, we want to be, um, you know, Komodo notarized. And it could be done without even necessarily having to do the same Komodo protocol. It would just be something that if Komodo notaries then 
do that and agree, then they would just run that node along with their other um, Komodo nodes. And it'd basically be Komodo notarized through a slightly different protocol, but by the Komodo notaries. But a company or an industry group of companies might say, you know, we want every member of our industry group to be the notaries that we trust. And so the way it works right now, um, Veris has its rules that are these auto notarization um, cryptographic rules that it requires in order to trust a PBAS chain. But the PBAS chain can have its other its own rules for how it decides to trust even Veris or other chains if it has a better way or a faster way or a more centralized way or less, you know, there's not less centralized, I guess, but a different way, you know, then it can choose to use a different way. <clears throat> so um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yes, um, it sort of reinforced sort of my understanding that the the, the various ecosystem has auto notarization amongst its own um, PBAS chains, whereas Veris itself is an asset chain to the Komodo ecosystem and is sort of upstream, pulled notarized, um, or, or is notarized by the uh, Komodo notary nodes. Well, which... Veris, Veris isn't. Veris is, was has always been a friendly fork of Komodo. You know, meaning it's not exactly an asset chain because <clears throat> it's. So right now, the Veris daemon is, in fact, um, you know, not compatible directly with the Komodo daemon, except through the protocol level. And we work, you know, together across teams to try to make sure that we, you know, help each other get technologies. Um, but it's not really exactly an asset chain. I understand that uh, okay. now right. better. Um, and with that differentiation... <laughs> Still, Verus is being notarized by oh, yeah. the notary notes yeah. um, of the 64 notary notes uh, of the uh, Komodo system and then in turn upstream into Bitcoin. So the fundamental security of that layer into the Verus ecosystem or the interface is basically uh, the, that notarization process to which the Verus daemon has to stay compatible in order to be regarded amongst all other chains that are notarized through the uh, uh, the 64 notary nodes, yes? Yes, correct. The proto okay. compatible at the protocol level. Yes. And 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 also the you know that's one layer of security and then the various um, proof of power proto the consensus protocol also has you know math like is mathematically provably 51% hash attack resistant. Okay. So that in, com in, in conjunction with the auto notarization within the virus system makes basically an own notary system outside of that what's already on the protocol obsolete or uh, unnecessary. It's only upstream then sort of adding the layers up to Komodo and uh, of course indirectly then all the way up into Bitcoin. Uh, that sort of requires and this uh, or sort of is the interface to Komodo. Everything below or everything uh, within the various ecosystem is basically uh, entirely uh, self-managed and governed. Every, well, it's not, there's no real specific governance model across the various ecosystem besides what it's capable of and the protocols that bind the different independent chains because um, every single blockchain started as a PBAS chain or even a reserve chain is actually a fully independent blockchain, can be mined independently, staked independently. Um, <clears throat> but in order to do the cross-chain operations, you know, needs to have this auto notarization or, and, and later probably will have options for um, other forms of notarization that people might want to, to provide. Well, Does that make yes, uh, governance was uh, in, in the sense that I used, it was meant uh, both uh, towards sort of the definition of the incentive system, as well as, of course, uh, govern governing sort of the technical details or the definition of the protocol. And I that understood. Of course, 
and that of course is uh, separate for the various ecosystem on downward, whereas sort of the Komodo, the, the Komodo uh, ecosystem and their concept of asset, you know, uh, outside of the realm of the, the, the various PBAS ecosystem entirely. That's correct. And the, and the other thing to note is that we, so the way that the, the protocol works between chains, um, we expect at first, you know, because we're, we're making the clients, you know, the community's making the clients. And, and so we kind of expect at first that um, people are going to be using our clients because it's a little bit hard, you know, to follow all of this protocol. We're going to need to have more documentation and everything. And so um, the, the fact is that when, you know, people could fork, they could make a, a PBAS chain, they could fork, and they could do a lot of interesting things on their own chain, kind of like we forked from Komodo and we did a lot of interesting things and are doing a lot of interesting things and creating this ecosystem, you know, people could do, you know, they could fork, they could still preserve compatibility with reserve protocols. They could preserve compatibility with cross chain auto notarization, these things, but they could make many different um, rules. They would, they would, they could have end up with a different demon eventually that could still merge mine and do these things that had different rules of their own. And as long as they stayed compatible with the protocols, um, you know, what Varus cares about on the Varus chain is that if they're going to control, if a chain's going to control a reserve, then it's that chain that actually controls the reserve. And right now, um, you know, people using the chains should use, obviously, as always with crypto, a trusted demon, you know, that, a demon that they trust. And, and if the majority of people are using a demon that that is one that they trust, then everything should be fine. But, um, you know, a chain could change what they do. And so they kind of, they, they really have more independence than people might assume or might realize just the way that JL777 always to- spoke about everybody having independence in the Komodo ecosystem. And then we came along and we we're really, really independent. I think it's a good thing. And they made... You know, and, and, and we continue to share technologies back and forth, and they made that possible with their perspective. I think it's the same perspective. You know, there are all these capabilities. Like, people want to stay connected. They will want to stay connected, but um, they can create their own kind of governance model outside of the protocols that are these cross-chain protocols that make things work. I understand. That's been, that's been helpful. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? Just open questions. And I think it's, you know, been about an hour on this call. And so if we uh, we'll wait a little bit and if we don't get any questions in pretty soon, then I think we might want to wrap it up. Can I ask one real quick question? Absolutely. Uh, my, uh, uh, the, the miners and stakers, uh, the, they receive the... Uh, Aggregator export fees, uh, is that like at random? Like, is that, uh, is that just random probability? Yeah, I mean, um, yes and no. Uh, yes, generally yes. But, you know, um, there are certain, so there are certain rules on when you can export, which are designed to basically aggregate as much as possible and pay more the more you aggregate. And so if there is not a lot of traffic between two chains, and you're a miner, and you happen to hit the spot between, you know, there are going to be a few blocks where if you don't have a lot of volume of transactions to be sent to the other chain, the rules will say you cannot create an export. So um, there's that random factor as well. It's just like, you know, did someone send a transaction during the block that you're mining kind of thing? Um, You'll have an opportunity, and probably every miner will take it, when there are exports to export to aggregate and and create those export transactions um and and so probably yes i guess the answer is generally it'll be random based on the different traffic across you know different chains um as to how much you can make and the larger the entire various economy grows then the more profitable it will end up being. And at some point, I really believe that at some point, um, 
mining and staking fees and, and profits and these will end up being more important that you're providing services and getting these different fees than even the block rewards. Because I think as the system grows, I just think that that's going to end up go, taking us beyond block rewards and still making a profitable ecosystem. And it really ends up being then an economy. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions about anything? All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining again. And uh, go ahead, Michael. I uh, know I was just going to say that um, for marketing related things, we were probably going to just to finish it off. We were probably going to uh, uh, marketing later, or we could not we schedule it, but you know, as a community. Oh yeah. I think that, I think that's a, uh, thanks for bringing that up. Yep. Yeah, in the, in one of the earlier calls, you know, people really started talking about um, things that we might want to do really outside of PBAS that, well, not outside, still related, but more related to kind of marketing and this kind of thing. And, and we were, some of us were talking and thinking that it might make sense to have, you know, a community marketing call. And now I'm not sure even that I'd be, or I'm not sure that Michael would be the right person to kind of drive a process like that, to have a, a call like that for the community. So I think we should think about it and maybe have a discussion about um, about having something on a regular basis and see if there are if there's some you know some genius marketing people or even just really motivated people on that uh, subject who could spend some time on it to help us organize some some community calls around it and and get put our heads together to do some some good things as we move to the next phase where we really are going to care about people learning about it and the foundation is probably going to want to even uh, put some amount of funds into helping to make that happen. Did you want to say other stuff about that, Michael, or about other things? I mean, that pretty much sums it up. We have some like going around to different places. So it'd be good to have a call to kind of organize them all and get it together. But like you said, you're obviously focused on the core stuff right now fixing everything that we find and I'm really focused on fixing the first and then obviously refining it and adding more things. So if anybody in the community, you know, has an idea for when we could organize the call or knows how to set for basically any ideas, then feel free to bring them up in the marketing channel, I guess. All right. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Um, I hope this was useful and uh, please, you know, try it out. Feel free to ask questions on the PBAS development channel. And as Michael said, if you have ideas or thoughts on marketing there, please feel free to join the community in different places and, and contribute. That's what we need. So um, enjoy everything, and we will get back to getting this stuff ready for mainnet. And happy testing. Thanks.